change host. Over to you. You have the power. Thank you very much. It's a bit strange because I can't actually um, see anybody, which is a really unusual thing because I think when you do a presentation normally, as I'm sure everyone's got fully used to over the last year, you're used to actually seeing people and having a conversation and get a bit of a, a, bit of a vibe. But hey, thanks so much for listening and, and sort of checking in and, and saying hi. Um, I think Rich has asked me just to, to take you through my Olympic story, really. And, and I guess the title, as it says on the screen, is Chasing the Dreams because ultimately, it was a dream of mine and I think for me you know chasing dreams is a really is a really key statement in terms of I think we should always have dreams and goals and aspirations however crazy they may feel or they may sound I think for me it's something that gets you through and I think at the moment you know let's face it probably everybody's dream is to get outside of their village which would be a really beautiful thing wouldn't it um but so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to talk you through my story a little bit and then um I think we should ask me to open up some questions. So my task to you all is to think of some questions so I'm not left hanging at the end would be a really lovely, lovely thing. So I'm gonna start with a time in my life, one of probably the best times, um, a time that I had dreamt of for eight years. And it's August 15th, 2004. Um, as you can see, it's, it's 11.30 in the morning. And I'm in Athens. I'm on this beautiful site. It did look a little bit more beautiful than the picture I've displayed here, but I don't have a picture of it. And this is sat up in the top of basically the spectators area, looking down at the course. But I wasn't obviously sat here. Um, I have to say, I think at this particular point, I was wishing I was sat there or sat on my sofa because I was feeling so nervous. You know that feeling when like your heart is in your throat, your mouth is dry, you feel physically sick. Um, I'd literally gone up this conveyor belt, which was like going like a gladiator into battle. That's how I remember feeling anyway. And I was going up to the top. And when you got to the top, you sat in this start pool. And I remember saying to myself, don't look out. Don't look for your mum and dad. Don't look for anybody. You must just focus on what you're going to do. You know, you've been training for years for this moment. And obviously when you get there, you go, oh my God, who's there? What are you looking at? But get into the start pool and the girl that goes before me just sets off and I'm sat there and I'm just thinking, come on, Helen, you've got 100 seconds to do the best run of your life. In the sport of canoe slalom, I don't know how many of you know what the sport is or, or isn't. It will soon become very clear to you. But you basically had, at this point, you had two runs that were added together. And I was now in the final. So I had a semi-final run. I was sitting in fifth place. I literally had to do the run of my life to get myself into a podium position. Um, so the nerves were there, as you can imagine. Um, the anticipation was there. But I knew... I believed that I had the ability to, uh, to, to do amazing things. It was just a matter of actually doing it. So rather than uh, talking you through the next couple of minutes and what happened, I'm going to let you watch it. I hope anyway. As Helen to the final run of this Olympic competition, she had the second fastest time yesterday in qualifying behind Bongart of Germany. She knows how to paddle this course quickly. The question is, can she produce the form when she needs it most of all? One pause, and she's thrown away. Milgatova is leading at the moment with a total time of 220.75 points. Two penalties there, my goodness. That was on gate number two. It caught me a bit by surprise. Now, was that wind or did she touch that one as well? She touched it, so an untidy start by Helen Reeves. I hope we're not going to have a repeat of what happened to Stuart McIntosh when uh, it all went wrong in the second third of the course. She's 1.5 seconds behind the pack at Helgatova, and it was a remarkable run down the slalom course by the Olympic champion. And she's really got to tidy up now, going through 12 and going through backwards, as she has always done. That wasn't a mistake, that was always in the game plan. So two penalties, first at gate number two, then at gate number six, but she really does seem to be picking up speed now. Coming down in front of all the spectators through number 16, safely, one more upstream gate to go, very close to that obstacle, underneath it, 
two paddles and swings away over to 80. This has got to be quick. Oh, she's got a problem. She's missed the gate altogether. She's got to go back. The challenge for a medal, I think, has disappeared. She overcooked it between 17 and 18. Had to go back, otherwise it would have meant 50 seconds of penalties. She finishes. And she may well be inside the time. My goodness, 1.98. She must have paddled extraordinarily well on the bottom half of the course. that was me and this is my medal if you can see me I don't know what you can and can't see it's most bizarre but yeah this medal um was like a gold medal to me it still is I think it was a big decider on when I decided to move on from the sport was was I ever going to feel as good as I did at that moment I mean that was for me a dream come true and as you heard in the middle of my interview with Susie Perry typically it probably could only happen to me that you find out to get a medal 10-15 minutes after a race but you know you you stood there and and when I actually got up on that podium yes it was a bronze medal but genuinely that gold medal sorry that bronze medal felt like a gold medal to me that moment I jumped around like a lunatic I think the girl that got gold certainly looked like she got bronze compared to the way I reacted but it's because when I created my dream I had absolutely no idea on what it was going to take to actually get to that point and as I said my dream started eight years to to this point um, and it was one success when I stood on the top of the podium, uh, which is the picture, as you could probably see, the only podium picture, um, when I was uh, 15 years old, the Junior World Championships, the same height, having stood on the top podium as the girl that got the bronze, because she was, I was 15, she was 18, she was also probably is still a giant to me, to be quite honest. Um, but I remember getting up there, I was so nervous about going up to get this medal, and when I stood up there and I looked out and I looked at everybody else and I thought, God, you know, this is amazing. This is what I, this is what I wanted. This is what I thought about and, and dreamt about forever. I mean, my mum reminded me uh, many years, well, what, probably once I got my Olympic medal, I'd done one of these talks as a, as a junior kayaker um, when I won my first ever trophy. And I remember it was huge. It felt huge anyway. You know, those ones when you're like, it feels like it's, um, it's ginormous. Now it doesn't feel quite as impressive, but you know, I still got that, that trophy. And I took it to school to show and tell and it got stolen out of the teacher's cupboard. But apparently I went home and I said to, uh, said to my mum, don't worry, mum, I'm gonna win lots more of those. So maybe I just knew that that was something that I really, really wanted to do, maybe slightly arrogant, I don't know, but it was definitely a moment when I stood on the podium at the, the Junior World Championships and did my slightly awkward way with my arms, with my big braces and my terribly dyed hair and um, stood there looking out thinking, this is what I wanna do. And then about, Three week, two weeks later, it was Atlanta 1996, and I watched this, this guy at the bottom corner, Oliver Fix. He was 23 years old. He was world champion, European champion. He just got crowned Olympic champion. And I thought, that is what I am going to do. So I created this dream. Didn't really tell anybody about it. 
and off I went to uh, set about doing it. And Oliver uh, actually happened to be my coach um, at the Athens Olympics, bizarrely. Um, he came in and started coaching for, for Great Britain and I eventually nagged enough and put in enough requests that I finally got um, coached by him. I'm not sure how happy it was, but I think maybe Athens made up for it for him. But he said to me after my race in Athens, he said, the thing that made him the most proud was the fact that I never gave up. As if you can take yourself back to the video, um, you know, there were many mistakes. I mean, the commentator kept telling everybody that I wasn't going to get a medal because I had blown my chances because not only had I hit two gates, I had to go back for a gate. And, and anyone who knows the, the game of canoe slalom, I mean, we always finish a race going, well, if I hadn't have touched that gate and if I hadn't have touched that gate and if I hadn't made that mistake, oh, you know, I could be a champion. You know, that's part of it. Um, but the fact was, you know, one thing he taught me that year, well, one of the many things, but one of the things he taught me that year was like, no run is ever perfect. It's like life, isn't it? Nothing well, things are rarely perfect. It's making the best out of what you've got. And we train for perfection. But actually, when it comes to it, it's those that get over the finish line as quickly as they can. It's not about being perfect. And that was quite a hard, um, quite a hard thing for me to learn. But in the weeks and months that followed that, I realized that it wasn't just about not giving up on that one day. It was about not giving up over many, many years. This is a picture of uh, me and my, my fellow Olympic canoeing mates, my teammates. Um, as you can see, I was the only girl. There was only, there is, was only ever one place for females. Um, and now we have two. We get a canoe and a kayak. Uh, women will be going to Tokyo. And um, we, fingers crossed, I won't be the only female medalist in canoe slalom when we come out of that Olympic Games. Fingers crossed we will get another one, although I always sit there slightly... Uh, slightly smug that I'm still the only one but equally for, for all the sport of canoe slalom clearly we want some more but the quote that I put up here is one that um, is really important to me so my mum used to send me a quote when I was out in Athens every day she'd send a, a quote through so quotes sort of sit quite quite close to my heart but this is one if you can imagine it you can achieve it and if you can dream it you can become it and as I said at the very beginning dreams I believe are really really important it's 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 important it's such an integral part of the way that we strive and we move forward is to always be looking at what we can do. And if you've got a goal or a dream or something you want to achieve, it gives you something to work towards. It's very hard, isn't it? And I think this is where everybody's feeling right now in this world of COVID. It's so hard to plan. And we're all struggling with that because we don't know what we can plan for. And so when you have something that you want to achieve, however big or small it is, it just gives you that emphasis to move on and to keep trying and keep challenging yourself, whichever way that happens. And I do believe if you can imagine something, then you can, you can go about achieving it because part of imagining it is the creation in the first place. So if you don't think about something, you're never gonna get anywhere. It's about getting out of the bed in the first place. So where did it all begin? Well. This is a picture of the Basingstoke Canal, which is where I, I grew up in a place called Fleet in uh, Hampshire. And I grew up paddling on um, a piece of flat water. So take you back to when I was, uh, nine, it was 1980, I was nine years old. And my brother got into, uh, got into the sport of canoeing because he saw a program on the television called Paddles Up. I don't know if anyone remembers it. It was around the same time as Kickstart. Um, and he saw it on the television and he was like, I really want to have a go at canoeing. So um, my mum said, all right, let's, let's find a local canoe club. It just so happened that it was literally about 10 minute walk up our road. So my brother went canoeing and thoroughly enjoyed it. And it just happened to be a wet February, uh, Tuesday night, it was dark. And uh, my mum basically was like, come on then, you need to come and have a go, go, go at canoeing. Nobody's at home to look after you. So you're gonna come with us and you're gonna have a go at it. And I was like, oh not sure I really fancy, it was really cold. I remember turning up and I, I rocked up and this, uh, this gentleman gave me this um, bag of, what only way I could describe it was, thank goodness Kit has moved on by the way, but the way I could describe it, it's like wet, stinky, mildewy kit that you find in a, uh, in a garage. You know, probably all, all of us at some point have gone to one of those outdoor adventure places where you get handed some kit that just stinks. Anyway, I put it on and I get in this canoe and I basically get about, I don't know, 
half a meter away from the bank before creating an almighty scene. My mum was thoroughly, thoroughly embarrassed. So I got hoiked out and that was uh, the end of what you would think was canoeing for me. But the following week, um, my options were to stay at home with my sister who um, was sat watching telly, but she's six years older than me. And um, we didn't always see eye to eye, I don't think, when we were children. And so my option was to stay at home with my sister or to go canoeing. And I think my mum was thoroughly surprised when I picked to go canoeing again. And she sort of had a little word that only mothers do in your ear. Like, hey, if you're going to come, you're going to have a good go at it this time. And you can, uh, you know, really put your mind to it. So when I got there, I got given the same amount of kit, same kayak, but this time I had a different attitude towards it. I'd chosen to be there and I got in and that was basically the start of canoeing. I mean, as a kid, I, I loved sport. My, I was very lucky. My mum and dad sort of did lots of different things. I was probably a little bit hyper as a child, always very energetic. And I think mum was always trying to think of something that could tire us out. Also being the youngest of three, you know, the other, my sister and brother were always trying things out before me. So I always had that opportunity to see what happened. And I just liked having a go at everything. But canoeing would have seemed not the thing that was going to be for me. But many years later, well, maybe three or four years later, when I was given the option by my parents, you know, you're doing enough sports now, Helen, we can't keep doing all of these. Which ones are you going to pick? I think their faces almost like hit the ground when I picked kayaking over many other, other things like tennis that I was doing at the time. So where did it all go to? And, you know, canoe slalom, it's like um, lots of sports, but like football, you go through the divisions and I slowly made my way up through them until I got up into the Premier Division and made it through the England teams. Um, and I became Junior World Champion, as you saw. Um, and then when I'd finally made this decision that I wanted to become um, Olympic champion, I started hitting all sorts of problems, ones that I could never envisage coming up you know I just thought well you become you, you become a junior world champion then you'll go on and you'll make the senior team and then you'll go to a European champions you'll get a European medal you'll just keep doing the same things and you'll get better and better but I was very very mistaken again you know I talk about these quotes that I like so one that I've put up here is a winner is someone that gets up one more time than they fall well I guess we all know that you've got to keep getting up and it goes back to that, you know, you got to get out of bed in the morning to make any strides in anything you do. But I don't think I probably appreciated how many times maybe you'd need, need to get up. I mean, for me, it's very much about success is about planning. It's about preparing. It's about being adaptable and evaluating and keeping that belief, you know, stay, you've got to stay hungry for what you want and building resilience. And these are all things that I write down because I can reflect on what I did. I had no idea really at the time that all of these elements were coming into play. So just as I sort of had made that dream, that goal, I carried on and I was doing what you would expect. And I made the senior team and my first ever senior European championships, which obviously I just assumed you'd float through and do super well. I hit a bit of a problem. I, I ended up dislocating my shoulder for the first time. I fell in going down a big drop and I, and I basically dislocated it and I crossed the finish line. And I can remember I was like obviously sobbing because I was in pain and I was in shock. And uh, the, my, I think the team doctor came running over and he was like, what's wrong? You know, and I was like, oh, I can't move my arm. And a fellow competitor came by, I was like, what's wrong with you? You just made it into, just qualified, you've just gone into the lead. But at the same time, I'd obviously just dislocated my shoulder. And I can remember thinking, oh, what am I gonna do? So I had to basically have it put back in by the, the team doctor, manipulated it, put it back in. And that was that, I went home and I had surgery and um, I saw a brilliant uh, surgeon. He was based uh, down in Reading and he fixed me and he told me, you know, I, it's all good, this new technology, how they shrink the capsule is gonna make you super strong and you're gonna come back. And that's exactly what I did. I had an excellent coach at the time, um, Bob Ratcliffe. He was um, the dad of our top kayak man, paddler, uh, kayak paddler at the time. Uh, and he built me back up 
and he built my belief back up and he created me an excellent plan and we adapted to what we need to do so what I could do to get back into the position I wanted to so the following year like I came back and I came back stronger than you know I had before and uh, everything was looking excellent um, until basically in the middle of selection I started subluxing my shoulder again and it started to to get weaker and weaker and it finally dislocated again and I was like, that's fine though, because I know what I need to do. I need to basically have another surgery and then I can have both shoulders and I'll be super strong and I'll come back and I'll be, be fixed. And I stayed really strong. I mean, anyone that's had an injury will know that training's hard, but coming back from an injury is much harder because A, it's dull. It's like at the moment every day, what are the options or what you can do? You're doing the same thing over and over again. And it is a little bit like probably related to, to COVID. You know, you, you can only run around your block. You can't actually run in a different county or what you can't pick a different piece of river. You've got to do the same thing so many times before you're able to move on to the next step. But I had this firm belief that I was going to be able to get to the Olympic Games. And, and when Sydney 2000 came and went and I wasn't the one that went because I was sat there in my armchair with a dislocated shoulder with my arm in a sling. I remember watching our female competitor at the time and and kind of just feeling immense amounts of jealousy that that was what I wanted to do but knowing that that was something that I was capable of achieving and and I didn't you know in many ways you go well you don't know do you because you haven't done it but I believed it was a belief of mine and and that's what got me up and got me training and, and got me back to to fitness and then in that Olympic year the Olympic qualification is one of the toughest things that people have to go through. I'm not sure whether everyone always understands that. You know, you see these competitors at the Olympic Games and you go, wow, you know, they're the pinnacle of their sport. And what's the crushing thing, certainly in a sport like canoe slalom, you know, in a country where at a world championships, you could have one nation that's in the, you know, their three top paddlers are in the top five. At the Olympic Games, only one of those people get to go. So one of the toughest things is getting to the Olympic Games. So for me, in the midway of qualifying, having had these two now beautiful, strong shoulders, had excellent training, in the selection event, which was the first part of a selection event, one of my shoulders subluxed. And I was like, oh no. But it didn't dislocate and I didn't have to go and have surgery. It just needed managing. So we had to create a whole new plan, a new way of doing things. And I had to kind of work out, right, how can I maneuver my way around what's in front of me so gym programs had to be changed they had to fall to the side so what can I do to be better rather than doing those gym sessions I can maybe spend more time on the technical side of stuff and I became an excellent technician of canoe slalom apart from perhaps some of the bits that you saw in my Olympic run where I have to go back for a gate but I, I became very capable and underst I understood very clearly what it was that I could and couldn't do and my limitations so having hit this barrier I made it into the national team but I still had to qualify for the Olympic Games and to qualify for the Olympics it was a long process and to cut a long story short the last part of it was a World Cup race where I had to medal at this World Cup race and the girl I was up against for this Olympic place she had to be out of the top 10. She hadn't been out of the top 10 in the last three races and I have never medaled at a senior uh, World Cup individually so the odds weren't against me and I can tell you that week building up to it all the toys flew out of the pram because I was feeling incredibly vulnerable so close to achieving what you want but also that realization that you might never achieve it and I struggled subtly struggled for that mental strength for that belief in myself I was still hungry but the fear of not achieving was taking over that kind of clarity and that hunger. But I had this excellent coach, Oliver Fix, who I told you about at the beginning. And he had just started doing something called NLP. And he brought out this book and he sat me under a tree and we spent a week rewinding everything that I was fearful of. And then rebuilding it up into a really positive state and bringing in all of those plans that I'd made making sure that my belief was there. So when I sat on the start line at the beginning of that competition, I knew I could do it. And cut a long story short, obviously I got the place, but I came out on the top of the podium with my first ever gold medal. 
at a, at a senior international and the girl I was against didn't make the top 10. So there I was on my way to, to the Olympic Games. And uh, it basically taught me everything or, or sort of said everything that I, I already knew. It's about these, these elements. You've got to stick to your plan. You've got to adapt. Well, I have a question. I've see, been seen that Isaac, who I don't know, but has asked me, how do you control your nerves at the Olympics? Well, it's a really interesting question, actually, Isaac, because you have lots and lots of training if you want it. We used to have sports psychologists and um, I was a little bit anti it because I always felt that they were trying to trick me rather than actually help me, which was a bit ridiculous. So I used to spend my time tricking them. But ultimately, how do you control your nerves? You learn to do it over a period of time. And I think you there's some people that do it more naturally than others. Um, and I, I think I was quite fortunate that I was always a really good, then I, then I trained, or well, certainly in the early years, and that was something that I was sort of renowned to do. But the real way is, um, is routine as well. You put so many routines in place. I had three, three songs that I listened to before I left the changing room. So I used to lie on the physio bed and I would listen to, um, Neil Diamond, Forever in Blue Jeans, followed by Dolly Parton, um, a nine till five, and then followed by the White Stripe, Seven Nation Army. And each one did a specific job because they would calm me down, build me up, and then give me that kind of fighting spirit. And you, you start creating your patterns. Um, but when I got to that start pool that I talked about um, in the beginning, it was very quickly, you can get distracted was then drawing yourself back in to what you needed to do then so controlling your nerves was looking at step by step what was gate one going to look like what was gate two going to look like and that to me is the same when you lose your nerve with anything it's about actually taking those steps back because you know sometimes whatever it is we want to achieve seems too big and if you break it down if I look at it now what would I do I'd do some sort of adventure racing I think that's what gets me buzzing now is that being out in the open if I'm totally honest, I wasn't the best at it. I found it very, very hard to switch off. So, you know, I was forever being told we need to do relaxation, forever being told I need to have a sleep during the day. And I found it incredibly hard. The things that I did um, to aid recovery was eat, you know, I ate very well. I always had a very good diet. I was very hydrated. Um, and they were the bits that I concentrated on. And then also sort of my mental well-being and... Um, health i did do um happy flex uh, relaxation listen to listen to cds um but it wasn't something that i found that easy personally um speaking as one of the british canoeing she paddlers ambassadors um sorry she paddles ambassadors have you ever felt that being female has held you back in any way and if so, how did you become this? If you didn't, why not? And what were your thoughts? I think I grew up in a really exciting era of sport where funding was just coming in, and I was very lucky to be in. I guess when I started, I was in a club that there was a lot of female paddlers, um, and I got uh, brought into a group of, of women that were old, quite a bit older than me, but they were all um, in Division One, and I paddled a lot with them and went up through divisions. I had um, a really great group of canoe style and paddlers around me. Um, and on all our river trips, there was a couple, always a couple of key female paddlers. Um, and then once I got into the team, um, just sort of made strong strong friendships with, with those people. And I think, it, I guess it could be quite lonely, but I grew up in a very male dominated environment. I think um, my club, I, I, I didn't mind that. Um, I think pushed me forward. I liked training with the men. I fully believe that I benefited a lot from that. Um, and whether that was because I actually grew up paddling with my older brother. Um, and so he would take me to all my events. He would drive me around and taught me to drive. He, you know, took me down, held my hat down all my slalom courses. It wasn't something that I, I felt. I'd be interested to know, you know, if that's something that, um, is it Claire feels that is holding is a sticking point at the moment. I know that I'd seen on uh, the Facebook group that, um, that I think it's a She Paddles Facebook group, perhaps that uh, there's been some comments around the lack of um, kit for females and um, 
and also pictures and, and videos and imagery and stuff. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, I guess going on that point, actually, I did always feel that kit wasn't suitable. And the one thing I did do was when I was on the senior team, I refused to wear my tracksuit. So when I won that gold medal at um, that World Cup race to qualify for the Olympic Games, a team manager had to take his tracksuit off to give it to me to get on the podium because I refused to wear kit that didn't fit me properly. And then I managed to get a budget for the team to have travel kit because I refused to wear a tracksuit that just made me look awful. Because I fully believe that if you feel good in your clothes, gives you confidence. And that would be the same with canoeing kit. Um, what, would the what would the opportunity be for you to make a return as <laughs> age limiter? Thank you very much, Jackie. Well, yes, it is, I think, to Olympic standard. But last year I did compete as a veteran and I did get quite competitive and I did win my one race that I did against somebody that has sort of persuaded me to do it. I think much to the disappointment of the uh, other guys in the race, I was the only female in that race, actually. Um, and I managed to do my neck in from too much effort. So there is a limiting factor. Yes, your body. Um, and I definitely don't bend as I used to. So, uh, so yeah. Um, what is your favourite gym exercise? Do you know, what? I really, really don't like the gym. But the one thing I didn't mind doing was chin ups because it was the only thing that I was actually quite good at. And there was a fa there was a time where I had to, I trained down in London in Teddington and it was with the um, England rugby players. And as you can imagine, so I'm five foot four um, and I was with all these England rugby players who let, were actually quite scary in a sense of how strong they were. And the only exercise I could smash them in the gym was was chin ups. So that would definitely be my favorite. Um, so did your trainers and mentors stay with you throughout your competitive career or did you need to adjust to different people and different approaches? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I had one coach, Bob Ratcliffe, who I worked with for years and years and years, and he was absolutely fabulous man. I mean, he helped, he, he literally nurtured me, taught me technically everything I knew. And he was so kind and gentle and worked so, so well for me. But when I moved on to work with Oliver, which actually came about not long before the, um, the Olympics, only about 18 months, the one thing that changed for me at that point was Oliver challenged me in a totally different way. He made me so uncomfortable. He made me cry. I had the Olympic Games, I don't know, maybe two, two weeks out. I was literally stood on the bank, the two of us sh shouting at each other. And my physio, who I spent a lot of time with, basically called a meeting where he called us into a room and we had it out. And he was German and he turned around and he goes, oh, I can't tell you anything. You don't listen. You have to be nice all the time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's awful. You're so horrible to me. Anyway, without him and that challenge, challenge I don't think perhaps I would have got that Olympic medal because I did need that kick really um, I also had lots of brilliant coaches so I just those two weren't the only ones it is important to have different feedback and at different times that you know it's crucial I had a number of different coaches and different inputs but they were my two key and they were very very different um, is that oh no okay what did you do when physically tired to keep yourself mentally strong what kept you going i ate chocolate helen a lot of chocolate and ice cream and it wasn't um I actually looked upon that fondly i remember on a road trip to um in australia with my coach oliver fix and paul ratcliffe and they literally nagged me the whole way there about how i didn't take enough care on my diet what do you think it did maybe more sweets because they were annoying me so much but ultimately um what did I do to keep strong I spent a lot of time I found the people that mattered to me actually when I mentally needed that strength I generally ended up going home to see my mum and dad and I built myself up that way and I surrounded myself by by the people that really mattered um and was kind to myself I guess and through all those injuries it was my mum and dad that were there at the end of a TheraBand every morning watching me cry and I remember when my mum drove me to my last shoulder operation she got in the car bless her it was pitch black she lived in Devon she had to drive me up to, to Reading she almost reversed into a hedge and she said Helen just please don't do this operation for me we don't mind whether you have it or carry on or not and I think it was that kind of um like having those people around you that, that, that keep you going. Okay. 
would you have encouraged would you encourage Charlie or Mayor to have a goal of winning Olympic medal? I think Charlie does have a dream of winning an Olympic medal. So it's a really interesting one of um, uh, uh, in our household because those that know me know my husband and I met at the Olympics in Athens, and he's a sprint coach. Um, and, and elite sport is very different now. So would I encourage people, would I encourage him to have um, a goal of winning an Olympic medal? Yeah, I encourage people to have a goal of anything that inspires them. So if that's what inspires him, then I encourage him to do it. Um, oh, I would also encourage all the way along the way is to not have that as your only goal. It's really important to have other things that you enjoy doing. And I always did, whether that was um, other sports, you know, whether that is spending time with family, with education, you know, it's important to have things. And that was something I suppose I will always have a lot of good grounding from my family, in all honesty. There was no slacking just to go on the canal to go canoeing. Um, I, oh, hang on a minute. There's one more, isn't there? Which is your favourite slalom course? Oh, La Cerda Shell's got to be my favourite slalom course in Spain. Love it there. It's one of the smaller ones too, that's probably why, because I'm still a little bit scared of big white water. So yeah, I think that's it. So thank you ever so much for listening.